Welcome to the I-29 Mu Yu Dairy Podcast. I-29 Mu University is a consortium of land-grant universities in Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and Nebraska. This podcast covers timely news, information, and research for today's dairy industry. I'd like to welcome everybody to the I-29 Dairy Podcast. Uh, this has become a twice a month feature from your I-29 Moo University folks. Just a little bit ago, we hosted the corn silage pricing webinar, and now uh, we are pleased to have Ryan Sperry visit with us on podcast here. So uh, Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Give us a little bit of what people have heard at the webinar. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. So a few things. I mean, obviously, um, we have variable conditions across the Midwest, depending on where uh, exactly you are geographically and how severe the drought uh, is or isn't. Um, and I definitely sympathize for those that are going through this now. I know it's, it's a difficult situation. So I think it, just a few general things. Um, really, we talked about spot pricing, corn silage, Maybe not. We talked a little bit about at the end about some longer term arrangements or more formal agreements, but uh, we started off talking more about I'm a little short on feed or I got a few acres of corn that I'm not sure what to do with. I might sell it to someone with livestock instead. So that was our uh, jumping off point. Uh, and then we talked about a few things on, you know, how do we determine what the yield is, you know, whether we can get some weights, we have an on-farm scale, um, we're going to do some estimates by doing some spot mini harvests in field uh, and some formulas to do that, or the one that people are probably most familiar with, we know what the grain yield is or can get an estimate on that, um, okay, can we use that information uh, instead? And with all this, I should take a step back, um, we're really trying to take you know, a broader view, what's the seller's perspective, what's the buyer's perspective, um, really at the end of the day, this is a negotiation between two parties. We're not here to set the local corn silage price for any of the areas we serve. It's, um, can we give you a range and then let the two parties take it from there? It's a business deal at the end of the day. And then after that, we demonstrated a little bit um, Different states have different tools. Iowa State has an excellent corn silage pricing spreadsheet uh, and article on uh, your website. I demonstrated the Wisconsin version we've been working on um, where we look at, again, um, do we have an estimate of what the grain yield would be? Can use that, you know, if it's 125 bushels, we can estimate, you know, you're probably at 16 and a half tons or something like that in a corn silage yield. You know, what's our difference in harvest costs for chopping versus what a grain producer might save they don't have to combine it now, um, so we can deduct that out of there. Some of those things, difference in nutrient removal for harvesting a silage, um, the seller might have a little additional cost there. They got to replace some phosphorus and potassium that they want with the grain harvest. Uh, just some of those general considerations to get at, at the end of the day, you know, what's a price floor bare minimum that a grower should expect. Otherwise, hey, we're we're better off just combining this versus what's the high end, the dairy livestock producer um, can look at and say for much over this, maybe I'm better off looking at alternative feed, give them that high and low end range. So Ryan, this is Jim Software with the University of Minnesota. There's some old rules of thumb that we always talk around that have been bantered around in the industry. Do you just want to talk a little bit about what those are and what are some of the factors that I might might affect those ranges because there's a you know reasonably wide range that we we hear talked about in the popular press and within the industry. Yes, yeah, so I think the one people are most familiar with you take X factor times what the cash grain price is, get your estimate that way. And depending on where you're looking, and when I was uh, looking at this for updating some of our information, um, on the low end I found seven, on the high end I found twelve. So there's two big factors that affect, are you on the high end or low end of that? One would be who's paying for harvest cost. If it's harvested, obviously that's an argument to go on a little bit higher end of that versus it's standing. I got to pay for the harvest cost. I'm going to bid you a little bit lower than because I'm going to incur that cost. The second thing would be what do you expect the grain yield to be um, on a lower grain yield fee? field, um, you might want to go on the lower end of that range. If you're expecting a high grain yield, it's an argument to go on the higher end of that range. So if I got to pay for my own harvest cost, I think this is a low 
yielding field, you know, whatever low is to you, but I'll just throw 75 bushels out there for argument's sake. I may lean, eh, I'm going to bid you seven or eight or something like that versus I'm getting this harvested that you're just going to deliver it to me. We have a higher grain yield, which means we're going to have on average, not all the time, but on average, a little bit higher grain to silver ratio. Then you might say, Ryan, you got to get up into, you know, closer to eight, 10, 12, something like that to make this um, a fair deal on my end of things. You know, we've talked about pricing silage for as long as there's been silage. But this year, we've had a lot of stresses in the the field. How is that affecting us as far as we've always had this price for silage? What's it going to look like now? So a couple things. I think if we're speaking in generalities, um, when you say what the price is, we're talking price per acre, or price per ton. So in very broad terms, drought stress affects yield to a greater degree than it affects quality. So if we're looking at a per acre basis, we have to take that into account. You know, there's what do we think is out there? Is some of this barren corn um, or not? Or, you know, how is that going to affect uh, what we're estimating per, for yield? So the other thing, um, when we're talking about the value in drought stress corn, uh, feeding value can range if we're looking at book value, you know, on the low end from 70% of normal all the way up to 90 some percent of normal. How do you know if you land in that range? Forage sampling is going to be really, really key this year to really get a better handle on what the variability is on your particular farm and what that feeding value really might be. In general, if we're talking more about barren corn, we're going to be a little bit lower on that quality side. NDF might go up a little bit, a point or two might go up on protein, but we're obviously going to be lower on starch. So that's what the difference is going to be. That's the argument that maybe not so much, you know, middle, lower grain yield, but really barren, um, no pollination corn. You might have to look at a little bit lower value per ton. But again, uh, and this came up on the webinar, important to forage sampling, realize there's going to be variability out there. I don't know that we really have a great book value um, that we're highly confident in to give one general answer on that. I know that's not the answer people want to hear, but that's the reality we're going to have to deal with uh, with some of the drought stress corn. The other thing that came up on the webinar, and this may not necessarily affect the price per ton, but just um, you know, be aware when you're harvesting high nitrates, fermentation was going to help greatly with that. But just keep that in mind, uh, especially if you do get some rains coming through close to the time you're ready to harvest. Um, we don't know mold or mycotoxins is a valid question, uh, something really to work with your nutritionist on, uh, especially if you had other stressors out there. Um, one of the things came up, you know, some parts of our states that also experienced hail. Well, now we got two stressful factors. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have guaranteed mold and mycotoxin problems, but it's two more factors that, you know, make you want to look at this a little closer. Yeah, we've had some drought stress meetings here in Minnesota, and one of the, that topics always come up because we've got some corn where there aren't any ears on, and we had a lot of discussion about how it's a fair way to price it. We had everything from, you know, should we price it like a grass hay? And I think to your point, Ryan, the discussion is if we can get a really good sample, and what do we kind of compare it to then, or do we sell it? Some people would say, we should price it like corn stover, you know, because that's sort of what it is, except I think it's going to be a lot more valuable than a corn stover because there's likely to be a lot more sugars in there. And typically these feed, you know, it, even if there's no ears, it'll feed better than corn stalks well after there's ears. So I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer, but I agree. I, I think if you can get an accurate test on that, that really can help in kind of determining what might be a fair price for both parties? I don't know, Fred, have you had any experience in this area with working with any producers down there? Not really. I mean, we I just haven't had that personal involvement. The question that I did have come in uh, yesterday as we were talking, his commercial chopper, his neighbor, doesn't have a kernel processor. And he says, you know, how much should I entice him to to make that available you know is that something that is going to become or should be part of the price say you know if you're going to chop it seven eighths versus half or one inch versus half and then have kernel processing 
So I can't say that's something I have, a, you know, we've worked into any of our spreadsheets or anything like that. It's a good question. Um, and obviously it's going to add a little bit of expense to uh, whoever owns that harvester and what they're going to have to charge back. Um, but also if you do have good processing, adds a little bit of value on uh, whoever's feeding it. So I can't give you a, a number off the top of my head on that, but it does make sense. The other thing to factor into, that, especially if they're inexperienced with it, uh, doing some spot checks to make sure you're getting the kernel processing you expect. You know, obviously it feels very, some adjustments need to be made to the harvester as you go along. Um, one of our extension engineers, Brian Luck in Wisconsin's worked on like a smartphone app that you can make a picture, um, get an idea of what, you know, percent kernels are damaged, um, which is what you want through the processor. The reason I say that is a processor for the sake of the processor doesn't have value. It's are you properly using that processor, getting the effect you want is the key thing. Another question, or a real common way to price corn silage in Minnesota, we've maybe got a little more cash crop than you guys over, do over in Wisconsin, but it's really buying it on a bushel basis. And I've worked with a fair number of farms over the year that that's just how they operate. And part of it is because our cash crop producers, they think of bushels. They don't, you know, tons really never enter their mind when they're thinking about harvesting their corn. So oftentimes there'll be a strip left in the field or there'll be a different way where they'll try to estimate the amount of yield that's in there on a dry corn basis. And then basically they price their corn silage so much per acre based on an estimated yield. Cause that's, that's kind of the math that the, the cash crop farmers think about, you know, if I've got 150 bushel corn, that's worth, you know, $4 a bushel, you just kind of do the math and you say, this is how many ac this is how many dollars I expect to get from that corn yield. I don't know if either of you have any comments, but that seems to have worked fairly well here in Minnesota, because I think we need to be, if you're dealing with cash crop farmers, you kind of need to be speaking of their lingo too, and talk about something they're really comfortable talking about. And they can relate to Okay, they can relate to bushels and they can relate to dollars per acre. And I think it, you know, it ends up being a pretty, I think it's a pretty fair pricing area when you, when you work it through some of the formulas also. But do either of you have comments whether that's a, a good way to price corn silage or is it really uh, advantageous to one party or the other? I think it, it's kind of the gold standard in this area, but I think it's only half of that gold standard equation. You know, uh, the having an on-farm scale that that truck drives over, that's the, the second part of that gold standard. I would agree. I mean, and that's how if you're doing pay, I mean, you're, you're paying per ton or whatever. I mean, you're trying to do it that way as well. I think what you said, Jim, makes perfect sense. And I know a lot of people that do it um, from the seller standpoint. I know they're looking at, just like you said, looking, what's the grain yield? What's the grain price? Two things for them to also factor in their saving on their harvest and storage costs. So remember that. They're probably giving something up, though, on the nutrient removal that we're moving a little bit more P and K, taking it as silage. I can't say those two always perfectly cancel each other out, but there is some canceling out there. But just keep those two factors in mind. There's some fine tuning you can do, and that's where, you know, if you can get a, a weight as silage, it helps you out some. The old kind of things that out there that have been corn silage is 50-50, half grain, half fodder, if you're looking at it uh, as a ton basis. That does vary some though, um, and that does vary some with yield, and that's where if you can get a weight, can get a little bit better handle on that, but I don't think it, what you said is wrong, Jim. I think that's an approach a lot of people take, and they make it work. The other thing I've run into that <clears throat> varies in this, and I don't know if there's, you know, you can't kind of think of scenarios for everything, but some of these are dairy farmers are selling to neighboring dairy farmers, and it might be a little bit more of a silage specific hybrid then. And so I got the question. So I've got a, whether it's a leafy hybrid, you now brown, brown midrib is a little bit in a league by itself. So that makes it a little more complicated. <clears throat> How do you factor in the value of a, a corn silage hybrid, for lack of a better term. One of the meetings we were at, uh, this was brown midrib, and the nutritionist said that he was pricing it about 8 to $10 a ton more on a scale. And uh, the discussion was, is that a fair price? And I, I think most people would believe that it should be more valuable than that, at least to the dairy farmer buying it. But it might be a fair price. You've got a yield drag on it, probably. 
I don't know if some of this is just kind of a negotiation that we can't think about every single factor, but Fred or Ryan, do you have any comments on thinking about these more corn silage specific hybrids and how they might play into a pricing formula? So the spreadsheet that we went through just in the previous webinar here is probably a lot more general than getting into that more of a spot pricing thing. But I do think um, there's some tools out there. Um, there's one that um, a little bit newer from Wisconsin where you can plug in from the dairy's perspective, uh, what's my expected milk yield difference? How many pounds change the components to figure out what's the added value of that production? Can I pay that eight to $10 more per ton? Am I getting that back uh, in milk per cow? I think that's a key question um, from the grower's perspective. Yeah, it's, you know, do we need to factor in seed yield drag differences? There might be a little value in knowing what you're getting. I can't tell you what that value is, but that would make sense. So I got to pay a little more to get a little bit more control, but then that control might be a value to me. Uh, the other thing that came up separate but related, uh, if you do have that relationship year after year contracting more acres, you might be trading manure back or some of those things. Keep that in mind that there's some of those values too that uh, might factor into that negotiation. Yeah, I think you're right. That's always a little bit of a challenge. And the other thing that's going to be challenging this year that really doesn't necessarily play, play into pricing is we might have areas of the field where it's really droughty if you've got some hay, you know, sandy areas and or hills versus low, just to encourage people to really do a good job of packing it. Because as you've got some areas of those fields that might be real dry, it's going to become a lot harder to pack. And make sure you might have to be sampling these fields a little bit oftener if you've got a lot more variation. Again, if you're buying from a neighbor and he's got a different hybrid or it's planted earlier or you're buying it because it's very droughty, um, you might have more variation in your samples through a pile. Typically, corn silage is pretty consistent or even maybe thinking about se segregating that out if you've got either you're buying some that's a lot different than maybe your corn silage or you're storing, storing it differently, or even within your field, it might pay to think about putting that in a separate pile. Sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't, or bagging it. And if you're bagging, just remember, there's just a lot more natural variation within a bag. So if you're running into areas with where there's a lot of difference in yield, you're going to have to sample that oftener, and it might be harder to pack in a bag if you've got some areas that are real dry. So again, not necessarily related to pricing, but just hopefully to related to feeding and get a good, good quality feed. And one thing we've had such, I mean, last year's corn silage just fed so well, and I'm kind of anticipating this year's corn silage may not feed quite as well. I hope I'm wrong, um, but I'm just anticipating partly because last year's was so good and that i'm glad you said that it reminds me of something a couple of things um that i might chime in real quick i think this is geographically going to vary quite a bit i think especially minnesota dakotas you're quite a bit drier than what i'm experiencing in my backyard we've had periods of dry and periods where we got rain just in time more uh locally for me so if the corn is done, done by you. Yeah, we do need to worry about, you know, still get it put up at the right moisture. Um, that's one of the basics of any corn silage harvest. Whereas maybe a little bit more over by me, where I don't think, you know, we have corn still alive. It's not, it's not done yet. Um, if we get some of these rains coming through spotty showers, it might try and rehydrate and we might have the opposite problem. We thought it was drying down and now we're going to hit a wet spot. So again, that sampling is going to be really important. And I'm going to plant a little seed with you. I know this is a tough year, a dry year. And again, I sympathize, but I found a little value in going through this exercise in the wet years. Um, and also um, I'm in a little bit more Northern part of Wisconsin, kind of that St. Paul, a little bit North of there for those of you in, in Minnesota for reference. So drying corn's a reality for us, whereas um, in Fred's neck of the woods, that may not be as common, but we get into a wet year um, with the challenges of combining, uh, challenges of drying that crop down, challenges with shrink once we start having to dry down that grain portion a lot. I think there's some opportunities in those years to market that field of silage instead. So again, hopefully we have that problem next year where you get rains um, and it's a different picture. I just want to plant that little seed with you that I think there's, there's some value in going through that exercise in a year like that. 
Yeah, I think that to your point, Ryan, I think this can be a win-win for everybody. I think if you're out in your neighborhood and we usually have challenges feeding our heifers too high of energy of feed. So don't be afraid to go out and visit with your cash crop neighbors. They're probably looking at those fields that are really droughty in some of these areas, some of this dry land corn, and they're really struggling in what to do with it. So it might even be an opportunity if you potentially have enough acres and corn is really high and you think you have some good corn or whatever that you might be able to combine, uh, it might be good for you and for your neighbor to get together on some of this that might not really be real good corn silage for dairy cows and buy some of that for your heifers or, you know, if you I don't know if we have any beef people listening, but maybe for some beef cows. And so I think sometimes it's always good to be thinking about is, is can we create a win-win situation for everybody? Because then that's really ideally what we want. You know, I've been hearing both the webinar and the conversation today, get that conversation started. You know, it's a negotiation. We have the, what can I afford to pay and what do I have to have? And that doesn't have to be the same answer on every farm. So that communication factor with uh, your neighbor is pretty important. Yeah, Fred, you're exactly right. I think having these conversations sooner than later, at least potentially lining up, because what I really don't want to happen to have people are chopping in the next few weeks and they get done and they look at their pile and they go, man, I'm really short of feed. What am I going to do? Now's the time to have the conversation with those neighbors and just be transparent about it. I think that's a really, really good point, because if you've been looking at hay prices, they're just through the roof. So I don't think we want to short ourselves on corn silage because I think we're going to be feeding very high corn silage diets to try and avoid when we're short of hay and hay's really expensive. So uh, I think you make a good point, Fred. You just start these conversations now and um, at least then maybe you can get something lined up in case you really looks like you're going to be really short of inventory, because that's hard to estimate. I mean, driving by a field, you can kind of estimate it, but until you're chopping and get it in a bunker or a pile, it's, it's a little bit, a little bit hard to know what you're going to get. We've had some really good discussion, shared some good information. Uh, I want to let the, the listeners know that uh, if they go to our uh, I-29 Moo University website, along with the podcast, they'll also be able to get links to some of the calculators we've talked about. Ryan, Jim, any last comments or take-home messages you want to share? We've got a lot of things to do in a short window to get them done. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to get enough sleep. We've got to uh, maintain our nutrition because everybody's putting in long hours. Uh, we've got to remember that there's a lot of moving parts on those choppers, on those baggers. So we have to be very aware of where our family is. We don't want the kids and the wife and the hired man hanging around. And I, I know they don't have time either, but we've all heard the, the newscasters say there's been an injury uh, during silage time. And we just don't want that to happen uh, when we're on the pile make sure that we're aware of who else is around us that we're maintaining all the, the safety protocols that we have in place Brian yep. and I last? think that's an excellent reminder very good. Well, thank both uh, Jim and, and Ryan for uh, visiting today. We look forward to uh, a safe season this year and I remind the listeners that this is part of our I-29 Moo University Dairy Podcast. We look forward to visiting with you at the next one. Welcome to the I-29 Moo U Dairy Podcast. I-29 Moo University is a consortium of land-grant universities in Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and Nebraska. This podcast covers timely news, information, and research for today's dairy industry.